This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. To be brutally honest, uh, coming up to this episode specifically, Loveland, I was in that situation where I get with some songs in shows where it's like, how am I going to talk about this song for 40-ish minutes? And then, when I started researching it, I didn't realize that there's essentially no true, like, this is the definitive version of Loveland. There was the original way that the original production did it, there was the way that the 1987 production did it, and then there's the way that the 2017 version did it, which was like an amalgamation of those first two. And then every other one seems to do any of those versions So regardless, it takes a while to get through what this song even is and what its relationship to the rest of the show is. Luckily, I'm really excited to share this episode with you today because I don't know how many of you know this, but I used to be very obsessed with YouTube and um, even made a journey to L.A. and then Anaheim to attend VidCon for 10 years straight. If, If you don't know, that's a conference for online video creators. Uh, I even made videos for a while, but... They were all bad and nobody watched them. Luckily, I have a guest who's actually good at making videos and is phenomenal at discussing scholarly articles. Steve Johnson is here and will introduce himself in a few minutes. But I wanted to also start this episode off by talking about an email that I received about last week's episode. You can always send emails to the show. Our email address is puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. This one comes in from David and specifically he's talking about the lyric in Could I Leave You, talking about the world's best books. So here's what David had to say. I just listened to the episode on Could I Leave You, one of my favorite Follies songs. You mentioned the world's best books series, which reminded me that in an earlier script, Buddy mentions to Ben, I haven't read your book on Wilson yet. Sally bought a copy, though. We keep it on the coffee table. To which Ben wryly responds, just the place. For whatever reason, that didn't survive the various edits that Goldman made to the books over the years, but I wonder if part of Phyllis's sarcastic world's best books was a nod to Ben's own handiwork. Very well could be. Sometimes in the creation of Broadway shows, certain elements from earlier drafts make it all the way through and are referencing things that may not actually be in the show anymore. But I like that idea if Ben is also a writer-type character of being that dig about the world's best books sarcastically sung to him. I do want to thank everyone that helps to support this show. I've been mentioning it now over the last few weeks about how I truly want to make this a fan-supported podcast. So thank you to everyone over at Patreon who is helping make that true. I also want to thank, in particular, the new patron of Carrie who joined this week, and also the holy triumvirate of Jack, Todd, and Barry, who are supporting me at the God That's Good tier. And now it's time for Plotting Along. Plotting Along is the part of the show where I describe to you what's happening in the plot. So things have come to a head. All our principal characters, along with their younger selves, all converge and confront one another. Ben yells at his younger self, but he is yelling at Ben. Ben tells Sally that he never really loved her. Everyone is speaking over one another, and then the music starts. The old rundown theater disappears to reveal an opulent, almost Busby Berkeley set. We have crossed the threshold into the fantastic. This is Loveland. Okay, I'm going to go thank some sponsors, and then when I return, it'll be my conversation with Steve Johnson about the song, Loveland. Putting It Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This week, we were brought to you by ATB. And today, I want to tell you about ATB's new podcast, The Future Of. Join Todd Hirsch, ATB's Vice President and Chief Economist, as he connects with special guests who offer unique and useful perspectives about the future. Explore how our economy and communities can not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. 
From the future of women in business to the changing nature of work itself, the future of helps us understand what's coming and what we need to do today to get the tomorrow we want. Featuring two episodes each month plus bonus episodes, the future of includes interviews with top community and business leaders from Alberta and around the world. Subscribe to The Future Of in the Apple Store, Google Play, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts are found. And connect to ask your questions about the future by emailing thefutureof at atb.com. This week we're also brought to you by the Alberta Podcast Network. So let's listen to one of our other great shows. Hi, my name is Kyle. I'm Dave. And I'm The Machine. And we do a podcast called Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine. It's a podcast where a sentient machine is forcing us to watch movies in order to prevent it from initiating the apocalypse. Although, Dave, you and I tend to talk about the ideas of the movie rather than the movie itself. Well, it's the machine's fault, like everything, and then by effect your fault, Kyle, that you've invited me, and this is the only thing I like to talk about. I mean, I'm not going to face the apocalypse alone, so you seem like a good patsy to bring along with me. If you wanted somebody that was going to give you some hope, you picked the wrong person. Kyle and Dave vs. the Machine is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. New episodes are out every Friday. Steve, thank you so much for joining me here today. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be here. So I think we need to start because you are a new guest on this show where we normally do with new guests, which is maybe describing like who you are, what it is that you currently do. I'm Steve Johnson. I'm currently a PhD student in musicology in Rochester, New York. Um, and I'm also a part-time classical music host at our local radio station. And when I have the time, which is not very frequent anymore, um, I am also a YouTuber who uh, makes videos about classical music. Uh, It's called The Listener's Guide. For your radio gig, I'm curious, is that a call-in show or are you picking the, uh, uh, the numbers to be played on the radio? Oh, yeah, I pick. If it were a call-in show, it would be a little more boring, if I could be perfectly (laughs) honest, because um, part of the fun for me is finding new music that people don't know. Mm. And a call-in show would be the opposite. It would be all the familiar music that people want to hear. Brahms 24-7. On Spotify. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Am I allowed to say Spotify on this? Should I just say that's that's fine. I'll bleep it out (laughs) to make it sound more risque, but it'll be fine. Um, (laughs) <laughs> what, what, how do you find new music, though? Like when you say new music, like new music in the classical vein or people that are composing music like modern day and putting that out? Both, actually. Yeah. The one side is newly composed music by living composers that needs to be promoted. And the other side is more obscure music that people have not celebrated as much mm. throughout history for various reasons. And what do you do like for your YouTube channel specifically? What type of videos do you like to produce there? Well, it's changing a little bit right now because I've been professionalized as a musicologist. So it started out as a sort of music appreciation channel. I had just finished my undergraduate in music education. And so I was trying to make classical music more accessible to the average listener in the beginning. And now as a musicologist, I'm much more interested in the history that got us to where we are and the sort of cultural values that we express by the music that we perform. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to um, get into the other people's shoes because one of my first loves when I when I was a kid, like 12, 13 years old, uh, a music teacher had us actually watch the movie Amadeus. It's a long oh, story. No. But, but I, lo- I fell in love with Mozart for this long time. Like that was like my, my gateway drug, so to speak. It's like mm. classical music and then kind of broadened out from there. But I always loved that. Like that was what I was listening to when people were listening to Nirvana growing up. Like okay. that, that was just like, I can relate thing. to that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got into Sondheim and musical theater and all this other stuff kind of fell into it as well. But 
when when I think people think of classical music as this like stuffy, maybe even highbrow art form that they're not supposed to be a part of or that they define boring. I did, how do you bridge that gap or do you try to bridge that gap? Yeah, there are a lot of different threads there because I think one important thing is that we have to be honest that it is historically the music of privilege and power. Right. And a lot of the music was commissioned by churches, by royal courts, by wealthy landed elite and so on and so there's a reason why it has that sort of elite aura around it at the same time i don't think that it has to part of the way that i like to break down those barriers is number one to give people permission to choose what music they like and don't like i Mm -hmm. think we we've been trained to not have actually any opinions about what we're listening to and let sort of gatekeepers tell us what is and isn't good. I want people to have opinions about the music that they listen to. And I also think that learning about the history of where this music came from and what they're trying to accomplish in a given piece matters quite a lot. We perform so much music on the concert stage and we're supposed to sit quietly and listen and let the music wash over us. But some of this music was church music that was written to be part of people's worship. Uh, Some of it was opera music, which back in the day, people didn't sit quietly and listen to. They were drinking, they were eating, they were gossiping with each other while (laughs) this show was going on. And then if they heard something that they liked, they would stop and listen. Um, You know, there's music that people were playing for fun in their house. There are just all these different situations where music was happening. And I feel like the concert stage kind of blurs that all together into one sort of artwork in a frame that we're just supposed to look at and assess on its own when really I want people to know that this is part of human culture. People were making this for reasons. Mm -hmm. And once you learn those reasons, I think it gets a lot more interesting and fruitful to listen and notice what they're trying to communicate with the audience. I think it's well said. I think that this is true for theater as well. And I know this might make some people mad, but it's it's my relationship with like Shakespeare, right? Like I love yeah. Shakespeare, but when it was performed, people were not sitting on their hands being quiet. Like there was right. people in the ground lanes throwing tomatoes, like they were in it and like calling. They were back giving to the advice to the characters. Correct. And stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like I mean, it was not like it, like the context that we like perform theater in is not the context it was performed in uh, many many years and ago have you have you heard shakespeare in op original pronunciation i have i've watched that youtube video and it like blows my mind like oh this yeah. is really cool <laughs> when you hear like original pronunciation and accent i'm like oh that's yeah. really neat <laughs> when you actually hear i it. saw an op production of king lear and it was a, a really cool experience love is not times full the rosy lips and cheeks within his bend and sickles compass come Love alters not with his brief horrors and wakes, but bears it out e'en to the edge of dumb. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, no no man ever loved. Yeah. Proved and proved and loved. I mean it's a lovely ending, isn't it? Proved and loved, it simply doesn't it work. Completely <laughs> falters it. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, no no man ever loved. <laughs> well, this is not a podcast about Shakespeare, although maybe right. I'll make one. <laughs> Um, which is, yeah, I'll do an entire um, chronological order of Shakespeare plays. We'll go uh, <laughs> lyric by lyric or line by line. Um, when did you first get into Stephen Sondheim? My first Sondheim show was actually the New York Phil in concert production of Sweeney Todd Ooh. with uh, George Hearn and Patti Lapone. The mm-hmm. like, I think that was like 2005 or so. Yeah. I loved Sweeney Todd. That was when I was uh, in high school. This was back when lots of different video rental services were moving online. And so I had rented the DVD from one that is 
no longer <laughs> in existence. Yeah, sure. And then I liked that so much that I followed it up with Into the Woods. If I'm going to be perfectly honest, I hated Into the Woods so much as a high schooler. Wow. That I, um, there are a lot of reasons for that. If you want to have me on for Into the Woods, sure, I, can, sure. I can share my journey. Sorry, there. does that still hold true today? I get it more now. I think actually Company and Follies and Sweeney Todd are probably my favorite Sondheim sure. shows. And then like Sunday in the Park with George and Into the Woods are very much in the same vein. And I, I get very frustrated with them because I think they take themselves too seriously. Oh, I see, Basically, I yeah. they're trying to make great art. And as I've just said about classical music, I, I have a sort of visceral reaction when people try too hard to achieve greatness. Sure, sure. <laughs> Which, you know. This is a Sondheim podcast, so I'm going to make a lot of enemies saying <laughs> that because he he definitely has his own mythology of greatness. Yeah, I will I will uh, include your uh, PO box so people can send you letters. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how about well, you mentioned Follies. When was your first yeah. introduction to Follies? I first saw Follies last year. Actually, okay. I saw the the National Theater production which was up on YouTube for a while, and it is not anymore. Correct. <laughs> I just really loved it. Yeah, I'm just excited to be here to talk more about it, I Excellent. guess. Excellent. Do, do you have a sense of what it was that drew you to it? Like, what uh, attracted you to Follies? The musical sound is a big one. It's a unique show of Sondheim's in that regard. Uh, I know you've been talking about pastiche every mm -hmm. episode, yeah. but the, the pastiche is a big part of the draw to it that he really captures a grand, very old school Broadway style in a refreshing and new way that also has a lot of interesting questions about our relationship with that music. Mm -hmm. So the combination of a nice sound and having a lot to think about makes it a really fulfilling experience to watch the show. Yeah, it is one of those shows that for me, at least I'll speak for myself, that every time I delve into a new song for this uh, for this podcast. It's like, I'm pretty sure I understand this. And then it's like you dig deeper or a little bit deeper and you see how everything kind of relates to itself. And it's one of those like happy, I don't know, miracles that's like, I don't even know how you would set out to make this because it seems so complicated once you get into yeah. the weeds of it. Well, there's also like when you get into the weeds of anything, you find all sort of interesting stuff and you have to wonder, is that actually there yeah. or is this just a new meaning that I'm drawing for myself out of it? I mean, I, yeah, it's probably more the latter for me, but I mean, <laughs> I, it's some of both. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I forget who it was. And uh, it was some uh, movie director who mentioned that fact about how it was like, you do all this stuff, you do all this planning, you 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 start filming, and then, like, your uh, kid actor can't come one day, so you have to, like, m change the scene around so they're not in one shot. Mm -hmm. And then someone online will be like, isn't it amazing that he did this shot this way because it, you know, underscores the the thought of him being left alone by the family. And then you as a director will be like, yes, I, I meant <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So Please give me credit for, <laughs> for that this. wonderful artistic decision. <laughs> right. So I think, it's, yeah, there's always that little bit of stuff uh, wrapped up into it. We get to talk today, though, about this song, Love Land, which I was mentioning to you before we started recording. I thought it was going to be, again, one of those ones that, like, I understood this, and then it became very frustrating to see that every production of Follies has essentially done a different version of this song. So we yeah. get to really jump into this in an alternate way. Uh, but a few things here at the very top. Not every single time, but primarily this song is sung by this character named Roscoe. And so I want to give credit where credit is due of the three productions that we are doing, which is that uh, Roscoe from the original Broadway cast is played by Michael Bartlett. The twenty, or sorry, the nineteen eighty seven London version is Paul Bentley, and then the twenty seventeen National Theatre version is Bruce Graham. I'm also going to bring up the fact of this. So we've talked extensively here about how the original Broadway cast was very much cut up, uh, much to the chagrin of everyone involved. And so Loveland is actually not on the original Broadway cast album. I don't think it was even recorded uh, to be brought back at a later time. It just was never uh, done. So therefore how the original version is supposed to be sung 
uh, isn't in the other two versions we're talking about today. So for today and today only, I am going to be using the 2011 Broadway version, the one that stars Bernadette Peters, although you won't hear Bernadette Peters because she's not in this song. Uh, that Roscoe is played by Michael Hayes. I think what the other thing we have to mention here, Steve, is that this is a pastiche again. Um, yes. <laughs> are you familiar with the pastiche that uh, Sondheim is going for? He was really trying to recreate the MGM recreation of the Ziegfeld Follies. I know. It's so like these a... 1930s MGM musicals are actually the way that most of us have the image in our head of what the Ziegfeld Follies actually was. And so he's recreating this already sort of pastiche nostalgia infused mm -hmm. production from the 30s by MGM that was recreating Zigfield's Follies. I know it's like a photocopy of a photocopy here yeah. at this point. So as he mentions, many of those MGM musicals were produced by lyricist Arthur Freed and this composer by the name of Nacio Herb Brown. I'm not actually sure if I'm pronouncing his first name properly there, but. <laughs> In your mind, the people that are listening out there, these are like the huge staircases, the lovely girls coming down in the extravagant costumes. Uh, Sondheim himself points out two numbers in particular that he is using for inspiration. So the first is a song called You Are My Lucky Star. Uh, so here's a version from Broadway Melody of 1936 sung by Francis Langford. I should point out the second song that Sondheim mentions is You Were Meant For Me. Here is a, a later version of that song from Singing In The Rain, sung by Gene Kelly. You were meant for me And I was meant for you Nature patterned now, Steve, as we were talking before, too, uh, those are the two things that we want to keep in mind as we're listening to this song. But you had a third one, right, that you think is probably a better fit? Yeah, well, those are great musical inspiration. So when you're listening to Loveland, you can hear a lot of that inspiration. But I was also reminded of a really famous number from an MGM musical. The song is called A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody. And it just has that classic 1930s musical never ending staircase with mm. thousands of chorus girls and uh, men in tuxes. And at the very top, kind of like a wedding cake topper is right. one especially opulently dressed woman who is the woman of the song who's like a melody. You play on the strings of your heart. You can imagine Roscoe just standing there and right. singing the song in exactly the same way. Okay, those are the inspirations going into this song. Let's jump into this. Uh, let's do how the original version of Love Land is uh, supposed to open. So if you want to envision this, uh, if you've never seen a production of Follies, essentially you are, yeah, you're imagining that big staircase, a lot of white going on, feathered costumes, that sort of thing. And then uh, a chorus comes out and sings... Time stops, hearts are young, only serenades are sung in love land where everybody lives to love. Raindrops never rain, every road is lover's lane in love land where everybody loves to live. See that sunny sun and honeymoon, there were 700 days hath June. Sweetheart, take my hand, let us find that wondrous land called love land, love land, love land. Everybody loves to live. See 
so from the original version of Loveland, what are your uh, takeaways from that opening? Well, I think that opening stanza really has the the crux of the scene. Time stops. Hearts are young. Only serenades are sung. Yeah. We're coming out of a scene where these four leads are confronted with their age Mm -hmm. and they're arguing with each other their younger selves are arguing with each other their younger selves are arguing with their present selves (laughs) and it just descends into total chaos and those are the kinds of emotions that it's very tempting to want to just kind of shove away, sweep them under the carpet, never confront them again. They're putting themselves back in this imagined youth, which we already know is not the way their youth really was. We've seen the whole time their younger selves fighting, but they want to convince themselves that everything was happy back then when they were performing for Weissman and the Follies. Mm -hmm. And so we can see them putting on this act. Yeah, this is honestly like the greatest like um, outward example of like going into your happy place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, uh, it that's what it feels like. It's like it almost feels like in um, like cartoon versions of heaven when they're portrayed, like the little harps <laughs> yeah. playing. You're out up in the clouds. Like that's really what the beginning of this Loveland sequence feels like. And you you kind of know just based on how the rest of the show is gone there's something that's going to like break this illusion. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it, it feels like uh, th- 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 this can't be how this show ends. It's not going to all yeah. end like a lovey-dovey place. Well, yeah. And that's what's great about this show. It's a, it's a real investigation of nostalgia. Mm-hmm. If, if I can put on my PhD hat <laughs> for a minute. There's this, it looks like uh, a Sherlock Holmes hat. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> there's a scholar of uh, nationalism in the Soviet Union, which I know doesn't sound like it's related. I promise it is. <laughs> Go on. Um, yeah. Her name is Svetlana Boim. And uh, she has this book called The Future of Nostalgia, all about how uh, nostalgia is the emotion of the 20th century and she breaks it down into two kinds of nostalgia restorative nostalgia and reflective nostalgia restorative nostalgia is like the belief that our characters are experiencing right now which is the past was great and if we can just recreate that everything will be okay again Mm -hmm. which involves a lot of lying about what the past really was like, because there are problems in any time throughout human history. Reflective nostalgia accepts this uh, more nuanced image of the past, and that's where the pleasure comes from. Uh, You're willing to leave it in the past, but it's still nice to think about it. So if you think of the song like, I'm Still Here, is a more reflective nostalgia where she says, I was poor, I did all these things to get through the Great Depression, and I made it. But it's still nice to kind of think about the old days. This is restorative nostalgia in Loveland, where they're like, nope, there were no problems back then, nothing bad ever happened, and we will be happy if we could just go back there. I mean, not to get into like too much of a political stance here, but why not? (laughs) We are living in that world nowadays. But it feels like that has been like this big push here especially in the like, like I will say the last 20 years over overall is that I feel nostalgia is becoming this corruptive force, not just in our mm-hmm. personal lives, but in politics and stuff as well. You have like, we're going to make America great again because apparent, like, you know what I mean? Back to some yeah. place that I don't think ever really existed, but we're going to bring that back and we're going to restore what it used to be like. Uh, but then you also have maybe a much less, toxic version of that but still toxic nonetheless where you see a lot of like movie series being like wasn't it great the original trilogy of star wars let's just do the original (laughs) trilogy of star wars again and like redo it instead of pushing forward and doing new stories and new tales from new authors it's like let's just do the same thing over again and that's why i think follies is such an interesting show to be looking at now in this modern context because i feel it really is showing when you live in the past, like you just corrupt your presence. Like you can't, you right. have to take this and learn from it for sure, but you can't just live in the past your entire life. It's worth noting that Follies did come out of a similar era. It was written mm-hmm. in what, 1969, like the end of the civil right. rights movement. Yeah. It was another really tumultuous time politically. And 
people were leaning on nostalgia for a number of different things. I mean, I looked it up and Greece was up for the Tonys the same year yes, as it was. Follies. Yeah, so yeah. nostalgia was in the air. And it's I think it's also worth noting that uh, Follies was doing some of that work. Um, Follies is only talking about the most opulent and elaborate sort of upper crust white art that was happening in New York and not talking about the Harlem Renaissance or the problems of the Great Depression or uh, any of the other sort of political art that was happening in the 20s as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's very much as much as it is exploring nostalgia in a really interesting way. It's exploring a very certain part of the New York art scene. Oh, for sure. And not itself giving a a full picture of what was actually happening at that time. Well, yeah, even more to that, if you do a little bit of research on the reaction of Follies, it was like, at best, you could say it was a mixed response from critics. Yeah. But there was a lot of negativity to it. But what I find fascinating is what a lot of the critics said in a negative way is like, almost like, how dare this show pro proclaim like this idea of of the follies and opulence is passe and like out of out of touch and yet like it was already falling and like in five years just completely gone like that yeah. the whole idea of this was like dumb by the late 70s if not the mid 70s so uh like what some people say is that follies almost came out a little bit too early to be fully embraced by the <laughs> the the critics I mean, it's it's so interesting how it get, gets wrapped up in a bunch of different viewpoints, I find, like that. Yeah. Now, so that's how the original version of Loveland gets opened up. And I will say that is also how the 2017 version is opened up. But let me tell you how the 1987 version gets opened up. <laughs> Roscoe comes out, and it's a, it's wild because it's a completely different melody. It's a, it's a very different song. But he says, take the highway of happiness through the state of bliss till you come to the country called Loveland. Every mile is a honeymoon, every step a kiss, in the country that people call Loveland. Loveland, where love decides the path you take, where hearts can stay forever young and never break. Every day is a miracle, every night much more, every morning more lyrical than the one before. Loveland, where sunny skies abound above, where everybody loves to live and lives to love. Take the highway of happiness State of bliss till you come to the country called Loveland. Every mile is a honeymoon, every step a kiss in the country that people call Loveland. Loveland, where love's the only path to take, where hearts can stay forever. Everybody loves to live and lives to love. So, this 1987 version, <laughs> um, I don't know, like, does this work better for you, the same? Like, I, I don't know where you stand on, on this. I have very mixed feelings <laughs> about this version, because on the one hand, I think as someone really familiar with opera, mm -hmm. this is a much more cohesive number in the show because being sung by Roscoe, for instance, and drawing quite a lot of its melodic material from Beautiful Girls. Yes. It's much more cohesive in that sense. Um, it feels like it's part of the sound world that we've already heard. But in that sense, I also think it makes it a little bit less effective because that's what's so striking. The first Loveland, the original Loveland, they're just going somewhere completely different. They're going to their happy place and you get the sense that this is going to be different. Something new is happening here. The new Loveland, because it sounds so much more a part of everything else that has happened, it doesn't strike that same like tone that um the original one does yeah why i've always been taken with 
Loveland song. It's it's not necessarily like my favorite lyrically. Absolutely, is not my favorite lyrically. Yeah. But what I've always appreciated about it is it does harken back literally to the very first song of the show. So like there's this like kind of almost symmetry that's going on. We're going mm-hmm. back to beautiful girls to kind of show, hey, we're putting on a bit of a show here again. And, yeah. And then so and then with the like the next four songs in this series that happen like back to back to back to back, it gets corrupted and falls away. And then, like, literally everyone has their mental breakdown. <laughs> yeah. So, and everyone leaves the theater super happy. They don't. But, I mean, like, it's, it's a, yeah, I just like that uh, callback to that beginning. Well, I think it's interesting, actually, reading all the stuff that Sondheim has written about this. Because his description of the collective nervous breakdown is not at all what I read yeah. <laughs> from this scene when I was watching it. Because it's felt like everybody gets a chance to express their true emotions for once in their... The, everybody gets their own follies number yeah. where they actually say what's on their mind. And the thing that struck me is that three of the four characters actually say what they've been saying the whole time. They've always been honest about it. Buddy was very upfront about his affair and how he just wishes Sally would love him. And the whole problem is that he doesn't feel like he's enough for her and just wants someone to like him as much as he wants Sally to. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Phyllis gets that sort of burlesque number about how she and Sally want to trade places, which they both also been upfront about. The first thing that Sally talks to her about is how glamorous she looked on the cover of Vogue. And then Sally sings a torch song for Ben, which is the entire show to this point has been uh, Sally pining after Ben. And it's only Ben that's there going, everything is happy. Everything is perfect. And then his number just collapses in on itself. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting that so many people, I, I, I just read it differently. <laughs> so many people think that this is a collective nervous breakdown. And I really think that it's Ben's it nervous seems breakdown. seems to me like it's Ben. Yeah we, yeah, we get to go into Ben's head where he's trying to figure out what his emotions actually are. And the thing that brings us out of Loveland is when he finally acknowledges that he can't keep putting on a show. I mean, uh, I can't necessarily disagree too much with that. I think it's supposed to feel like uh, like the scene leading into this normally is staged as like them, yeah, having that big argument, right? And yeah. then it's it's like Loveland is like the bomb that goes off in the middle of them right. having that <laughs> argument, and then we kind of have all the falling action until Ben like collapses on the ground, and like that's kind of the end of your show, sort of thing. I do love the looks on everybody's faces. If ever, if anyone can find the 2017 follies mm-hmm. when when Loveland comes out and all four of the characters are just looking around like what the heck is going on around right, right. me and they like drop lays on their shoulders and stuff it's great <laughs> uh one thing i will call out about this london version like just reading the lyrics i don't know I, there, there's a lovely bit of language that sondheim uses in in this section the the way that he rhymes like sort like miracle with lyrical that's really fun. I like when there's yeah. like interesting rhymes that go on like that. Every mile is a honeymoon. Every step a kiss in the country that people call love land. I mean, I, I call this out all the time and maybe it's getting boring at this point, but I, I just appreciate how much Sondheim is able to sometimes write lyrics that sound like people actually talking, but are actually lyrics that rhyme. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they kind of just flow really, really nicely. So I think this is a great example of that yeah. specifically. Flipping back to the original Follies, because the, as I mentioned, the 2017 does the same opening that we just mentioned of the original Follies, but then it goes very differently. It actually shares a lot more with that 1987 version. So uh, we're going to use the uh, 2011 version here next to kind of finish off what the original Loveland feels like. So basically how that was structured is that like as they call them the, the Cavaliers, but it's basically like the women... Uh, coming out right uh, in their in mm-hmm. different costumes, and so uh, it's not really sung as much as like a spoke sung in this case. But the first person, the first cavalier, comes out and says, "To lover's ears, a lover's voice is music, a song that no one but a lover knows." And then the chorus sings, "Love land where everybody lives to love." To lover's ears, a lover's voice is music, a song that no one but a lover knows. Love land. And then the second cavalier comes out to lover's lips. A lover's lips are petals, a velvet promise budding like a rose. 
And then the chorus comes back, Love Land, where everybody loves to live. A lover's lips, a lover's lips are petals. A velvet promise budding like a rose. Love Land, where everybody loves to live. And then the third cavalier comes out, the lover is transported by his rapture, as ever heavenwards his heart ascends. And then the chorus goes, Love Land, Love Land. The lover is transported by his rapture, as ever heavenwards his heart ascends. Love Land, Love Land. Let's pause there for a second. These kind of like statements of love. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. How do you take them? How do you, how do you interpret this? I think that. Sondheim worked real hard to make these as saccharine as possible. (laughs) He's he's really trying to drive home the point that this is a sentimental, sweet land. And he's also just totally nailing the style of these numbers from the MGM musicals and seeing these lines delivered by you know, women in these elaborate costumes where it's like French Rococo meets like random architectural elements. Um, Yeah, yeah. It's it's just like just the most over the top, uh, elaborate, ornate 1930s. I don't even know what word I'm looking for. It's just he's he's just, you know, slathering on the sugar right now (laughs) on purpose. (laughs) Um, I mean, yeah, for me, this is uh, reminiscent of I like I took an English degree when I went to university and reading like romantic poetry a lot of times, definitely in the 1800s where you have stuff like this, like your skin is as white as snow. And it's like the snowiest snow of snow. It's like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, unlike romantic poetry, you don't get the sense that there's any angst here. It's all yeah. just sentimental. Like th- there it's, it's hard to say that there's even an emotion, like they're talking about love, but it's just sort of the sweetest, most surface level love that you can think of. Well, I think, I mean, maybe this is part of like the direction too, but, to underscore that because i agree is like it's almost like they were told to state these uh, lines in like the most flat way possible like they're, right. they're not like they don't feel like they're in love right they're right. like da, 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 da. like we're just like talking about like love as a concept uh instead of actually love as the actual emotion itself yeah. here is how we uh continue on here though so the fourth cavalier comes out and says the lover's heart contains a lover's secret which only the beloved comprehends and the chorus continues going on, Love Land, Love Land. The lover's heart contains a lover's secret, which only the beloved comprehends. Love Land, Love Land. Then the fifth cavalier comes out, Two lovers are like lovebirds in devotion. If separated, they must swoon and die. The chorus says, Love Land, where everybody lives to love. Lovers are like lovebirds in devotion. If separated, they must swoon and die. Love land, where everybody lives to love. And then finally, the sixth cavalier comes out and goes, To lover's eyes, a lover's eyes are jewels more radiant than the stars that light the sky. And the chorus goes, Love land, where everybody loves to live. To lover's eyes, a lover's eyes are jewels more radiant than the stars that light the sky. Love land, where everybody loves to live. Okay, so I think a continuation of kind of what we've already been mentioning here, but uh, any of these, uh, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to mention about what these cavaliers are saying. Um, the only thing that I would mention is that this fifth cavalier line is almost always the funniest one if you <laughs> watch productions of this, um, because the dress, first of all, is usually one of the most ridiculous because all of the dresses are themed by what mm. what the line is. This one, instead of an actual dress, it's usually like two birds or two fish or something right, with water. Right. Like she looks like a fountain, which is just... It's just so much. I love it. And um, and then this line, if separated, they must swoon and die. Yeah. Is almost always delivered in the most over the top fashion. Acted like, like, the like audience. back of hand to the forehead, like almost swooning yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, like I was saying, the London version has a different like uh, second half here, but the 2017 version steals it. They do the exact same. And so they do the beginning of the original Follies and then they use the second half of the London Follies to just be like this weird Frankenstein creation. However, 
Roscoe comes out then and he basically introduces a single girl comes out and how the 2017 version did it because it's the only one I've actually seen is basically like one girl will come up and she'll do this thing with her dress where like an L comes up and then he'll talk about the L and then the O comes up and etc. So Roscoe says L is for the long, long road ahead that leads all lovers to the landscape of their dreams. And then the company goes, Love Land, Love Land. L is for the long, long road ahead that leads all lovers to the landscape of their dreams. Love Land, where everybody lives to love. The second girl comes out and he says, O is for the overwhelming optimism only lovers know, or so it seems. And then the company goes, Love Land, Love Land. O is for the overwhelming optimism only lovers know, or so it seems. Do you, I know we mentioned, we already mentioned the, the Cavaliers. With this, as we were kind of literally spelling out Loveland as the girls come out, uh, I don't know, how, do you like this better? Or again, what is it that you, how do you compare these two? Well, he, he does say that part of the reason that this number had to happen this way, even though he doesn't entirely remember why it was completely rewritten, is that they didn't have the same number of showgirls as the original production. So this mm. was just a way to work with fewer (laughs) showgirls. They don't have the same elaborate costumes, which is a little bit disappointing. As far as the text goes, I feel like this is just, you know, Sondheim is always a fan of doing any kind of wordplay that he can. So this (laughs) is just the long, long road ahead that leads all lovers to the landscape of their dreams. Just like how many L's can you throw in there, Steve? Yeah. And same with the O's, right? The overwhelming optimism, only lovers or so it seems like he's having fun, obviously. Yeah. I don't know if it is because it's the only version I've seen, but I actually really like this one as he like him introducing the girls. I agree though. I wish there was like a more like opulent dresses or something that that were going on. But for some reason, I actually really like this, (laughs) this, uh, this way of doing it. Yeah. It's like, I don't think it's as important for the drama, what he's saying, because the point is that he's just saying these sort Mm -hmm. of meaningless phrases about love. (laughs) Well, uh, talking about that, this is how this kind of section ends, which is V is for the various vicissitudes they'll weather because it's also for the vow they made together. And the company says, love land, love land. V is for the various vicissitudes they'll weather because it's also for the vows they made together. Love land, love And then finally, Roscoe goes, E is for the endless expectations lovers elevate so often to extremes. And then the company goes, Love Land, Love Land. E is for the endless expectations lovers elevate so often to extremes. Love Land, Love Land. And then they come together, Love Land, where sunny skies abound above where everybody loves to live and lives to love now there's still gonna be some more that we're gonna add on to that but uh, any any call outs about uh this section at all not specifically no i don't i, I think, love I the mean, fact that the he uses various vicissitudes, vicissitudes yeah <laughs> that's <laughs> that was that was a good choice for sure this a slow clap from me in the back of the, of the theater <laughs> right. it's like all right you 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 were able to get vicissitudes into a lyric <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's kind of the experience of um, watching Sondheim, though, is that Mm -hmm. every once in a while, there's a moment where you're like, okay, we get it. You're clever. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. That's right. So the weird thing is this, is that in the book, Finishing the Hat, this is essentially where, uh, at least for the 87 version, the lyrics end. There's no additional lyrics to talk about. However, in the 2017 version, there's more. Uh, so I wrote them down okay. <laughs> of, of what uh, what they actually say. Um, so I don't know if he just forgot about them or this was something that was only added into the 2017 version. That's probably what happened. I know that it was in the, the 2001 revival. Okay, there we go. So the L-A-N-D they add. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know if that was the first time either. Mm-hmm. Now, in the 2017 version, I know what happens here is that there's one uh, last girl that comes out and land is all on her costume. So it's not like (laughs) uh, one person for the last four letters. But Roscoe goes, L is for the lies that get perfected. A is for the aims that go awry. 
love land where everybody gets to live to love. L is for the lies that get perfected. A is for the aims that go awry. Love land where everybody lives to love. N is for the needs that get neglected. D is for the doubts that never die. Love land where everybody loves to live. N is for the needs that get neglected. D is for the doubts that never die. Love land where everybody loves to live. And then, just to make things super complicated, it actually goes back to the original Follies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and ends off the same way the original Follies is supposed to end, which is lovers pine and sigh but never part. Time is measured by a beating heart. Bells ring, fountains splash, folks use kisses instead of cash in love land. Love land, and then they say love and love land like 27 times. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that's how the song ends at the very least. <laughs> For this last little bit, though, of him spelling out land, uh, anything that jumps out at you there? Yeah, I actually, this is a choice that I don't really like that much because, as we've been saying, this is supposed to be the happy song. This is supposed to be the one that mm. sets the illusion that slowly gets questioned over the course of the next, is it five songs? Uh, four songs that follow. So one for the principal cast. Loveland is, yeah. So Loveland is one and then four. That's the five. But then there's also oh, the ghosts right. before yeah, that. You're the ghosts right. get that one. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. There is five. <laughs> because, and I, I feel like the ghost song is only in there because everybody needs to do their costume change for their, uh, big number. But <laughs> yeah, anyway. I, you're probably not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't like this edition because it, it leads you to question Loveland already. Hmm. And I would rather do that in the later songs. I'd rather this one be sort of pure happiness. It already gets a little bit undercut once they start spelling out, you know, doubts that never die and whatever else was in there. It, that, that's the hard part. As a weirdo who just loves alliteration a lot, is that D, like D is for the doubts that never die. It's like, oh, that's a great line. I love that. Yeah. Or like needs that get neglected. So all this stuff is like, I love it. But I, I think it is something that is almost like overstays its welcome a little bit. Like, yeah. the, like the original version of, of, of Love Land and the original Follies is like, it's set up. It's these Cavaliers who come out, say these like little platitudes that don't really mean anything. But it's like, yeah, I feel happy. That's a nice little song. And then it's not until... Like you said, those later songs where it's like, oh, she's losing her mind. She's like at the end of her rope and he has right. a mental breakdown. Like it all kind of makes yeah. makes that more thematic sense by the end. I, I guess that answers the question here then, which is, as, as sometimes states, it's the beginning of the psycho follies as we get uh, through Loveland. Um, I, I know where you stand on it as far as like which version best uh, sets it up. But I, I, what I've been asking people is, do you have a favorite recorded version of this song? Or of Follies in general? Uh, for this song, no. Um, this is one that I pretty much only ever hear in the context of, you know, listening to Follies all the way through. Mm -hmm. Which I think is part of the appeal of the song. Um, because it it's so important to the drama that it only makes sense in the drama and not as like a cabaret number or something right. like that. Um, but as far as cast recordings... I am terrible at picking favorites in general. I think the one that I've listened to the most frequently is the Bernadette Peters one. Right. But basically anything that's available on my streaming services, I kind of rotate it just to keep keep some variety in there. <laughs> no, for sure. I, I, I don't want to end our episode without talking about this because it really fascinated me when we were, before we started recording you mentioned this thing about uh the fantastic the fantastic yeah uh, and i want you to mention that because i think it has a lot to say about this show in particular and this number in particular yeah so this uh french 
literary theorist Todorov. I'm not going to try to say his first name. No, that's right. It's, it's, I'm um, sure you Eastern nailed European. it, though. Um, but his last name is Todorov. Talks about this idea of the fantastic, which was a literary movement in the early 19th century, which is the hesitation that you feel between trying to judge whether something is uncanny or marvelous. The idea for both of them is that something crazy has happened and you don't have an explanation for it yet. Some kind of phenomenon. Uncanny is a phenomenon that can be explained through natural means, such as mm -hmm. it was only a dream or it was a machine or something like that. And then the marvelous is where the story confirms that it's supernatural. The fantastic goes to that place, shows you the phenomenon, and refuses to give you the answer. <laughs> and so that, um, that moment when you see the phenomenon is called the threshold. For me, Loveland is the threshold piece. All of the characters thus far have been grounded in reality. We see them in a dilapidated theater, walking around. The conversations that they have, we understand as being real. We also see their ghosts, but it doesn't occur to us, or I guess it doesn't occur to me watching the show, that the ghosts are actually real. It's kind of a stylized mm -hmm. uh, way to represent the fact that they're surrounded by their memories, but you never actually consider that they could be actual ghosts. And then when chaos happens, they do actually start interacting with the ghosts. They all start yelling at each other in all these different ways. And you go, wait a second. I thought, the, I thought this was just their memories. Are you telling me that these are actual things that are actually there? And then they go into Loveland, which starts off a very traditional follies. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you could say this is all in somebody's mind. And on the other hand, there's room to imagine that this is actually a follies that they're performing for that night to commemorate the theater. It could be an actual event that's happening. Obviously, we find out that it's not when it all collapses around Ben. But the fact that it could be is that sort of fantastic moment. You don't 100% know what's real and what's not real and how to explain everything that's happening on stage. No, I, I really like that that breakdown of this moment, because uh, as I know, I've mentioned before already on this podcast, uh, Follies has this really interesting progression where when you first come into it, it's like, OK, I, I kind of know where this show is going or feels like you do. Like the, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the plot as it is, is pretty heavy in like the first 20 minutes. And then it's just like, OK, a bunch of numbers. And then we get to this section, which is all very like stylized, like there really is no plot. It's just song, 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 song. But then has that like amazing moment at the end where, you know, <laughs> there is that collapse and we're back into reality again. Yeah. Um, but I would never would have been able to, I don't think, effectively communicate that idea of like, this is really that crossing of the threshold, that crossing of like, we are going from reality to complete fantasy. <laughs> uh, and this is the number that kind of helps us get well, there. Well, yeah, but that's the thing about the fantastic is that yeah. it's not complete fantasy. It's that you don't know. <laughs> right. No, sure. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you don't know if this is real or not. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining me here today. This is really fun. And I should have you back on and then you can make other people mad for you not liking Into the Woods. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be the curmudgeon that yeah. you invite on. <laughs> no, that's right. If people did want to stay in contact with you online, what's the easiest way for them to do so? Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Steve Tom John. I'm there occasionally. <laughs> um, you can subscribe to me on YouTube. It, the channel is called The Listener's Guide. And I also have a bunch of contact information in the profiles of both of those places. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to putting it together podcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network and to ATB this week. Putting it together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from, consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we're going to be talking about you're going to love tomorrow slash love will see us through. Well, until something better comes along. 
As always, a big thanks to the great Chris Taniguchi who designed the podcast artwork and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now.